We find the defendant guilty as charged. It is ordered, adjudged, and decreed that Walter McMillan is to face death by electrocution. A story of racism, misconduct, and pure injustice in a system that is meant to be just. This is the story of Walter McMillan. On November 1st, 1986, an 18-year-old white woman named Rhonda Morrison was found murdered in this dry cleaning store in Monroeville, Alabama. Local law enforcement of this small town were not necessarily equipped to handle major crime scenes and consequently made several mistakes during the period of investigation. When the officer from the Alabama Bureau of Investigation arrived, the crime scene had been contaminated and Rhonda's body had already been removed, making an accurate collection and examination of evidence impossible. Though the police had no obvious suspects, several people were interviewed, but the murder ultimately remained unsolved for seven months. Then, in June of 1987, Walter McMillan, also referred to as Johnny D by those close to him, was arrested by Monroe County Sheriff Tom Tate for the crime which he had not committed. An unlikely suspect, McMillan was 45 years old with no prior criminal record. He had a good job as a self-employed logger and was an integrated member of his community. However, he also happened to be a black man who in his past had had an affair with a white woman. This interracial affair dragged McMillan into the limelight and led to the desperate targeting made by the police. Despite not having yet gone to trial, let alone been convicted of a crime, the sheriff arranged for McMillan to be sent to Alabama's death row, which is reserved for those already convicted and awaiting execution, where he spent 15 long months prior to his trial date. Because the case had gained a large amount of publicity, emotions were high in Monroe County, where the white population made up 60% of the total county population. In an effort to ensure a fair trial for McMillan, the defense requested the trial be moved. Taking advantage of this request, the local circuit court judge agreed, moving the trial to Baldwin County, where the white population was significantly higher, standing at 86%. The trial then began on August 15, 1988, lasting only one day and a half. Despite the fact that there was absolutely no physical evidence linking McMillan or anyone to the crime, and the testimony of a dozen witnesses, who also happened to be black, placing him at a fish fry 11 miles away from the dry cleaning store where Miss Morrison was murdered at the time of the crime, he was still convicted. It's important to note that the U.S. Constitution states that defendants are entitled to a jury of one's peers. However, McMillan's jury consisted of 11 whites and only one African American. To convict, the state had built their entire case on the coerced testimony of not one, but three witnesses. Their main witness, Ralph Myers, was a career criminal who at the time was awaiting trial and facing a possible death sentence for another murder. He had testified that he had been in McMillan's truck at the time of the murder when he heard gunshots and saw McMillan holding a gun. You heard gunshots. Right. He also provided details on where and how he found the victim laying. When you went inside, what did you tell them you saw? I told them that I had seen a young girl laying on the floor with her mouth open. Dead. By law, the state needed testimony to corroborate what Myers had said, which led to the testimony of their two other witnesses, Bill Hooks and Joe Hightower, who both claimed they had seen McMillan's low-rider truck at the cleaners and driving away from it. The jury sided with the state, convicting McMillan of capital murder and sentencing him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. However, in Alabama, trial judges hold the authority to override a jury's verdict. So, McMillan's sentence was overridden by Judge Robert E. Lee Key and was instead sentenced to death by electrocution, ultimately once again sending him to Alabama's death row where he would spend another six years. How exactly could a case have gone so terribly wrong? There is no single reason. In fact, it was a plethora of factors that led to the merciless wrongful conviction of McMillan. His case caught the attention of his soon-to-be attorney, Brian Stevenson, from the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. 
It was him who brought these factors to light in filing a petition for a new trial in 1991 amidst the abundant discovery of exculpatory evidence. I was innocent, totally innocent, and I had all kind of alibis to prove I was innocent. And people had got there, got paid people to lie on me. And, uh, and I know I was innocent. I wasn't no doubt about that. And I said, if I just get the right lawyer, if I get me a good lawyer. The problems began in the pre-trial stage of McMillan's case. Murder was not something familiar to Monroeville. Thus, the local law enforcement was not well prepared in investigating the crime scene. There was clear evidence of police misconduct as unintended errors were made by those who arrived at the crime scene. Not only was there improper handling of evidence, which remains a major factor involved in wrongful convictions to this day, evidence was also tainted and tampered with in the moving of the victim's body eliminating any possibility of reliable physical evidence to, beyond a reasonable doubt, connect any suspect to the murder. This particular case of the murder of a beautiful, young, white woman in a predominantly white community spread public fear and anger through the small town. These emotions were only exacerbated by the media's pre-trial publicity of the high-profile case and the seeming inability of the police to solve the crime and put the victim's family and the public at ease. The pressure placed on police to convict continued to grow as time passed, resulting in their tunnel vision towards McMillan. This tunnel vision occurs when police focus on one individual and one individual only. It results in an overly narrow focus on an investigation, often distorting the evaluation of any potential information or evidence that may point away from a suspect's guilt. McMillan was an easy target because he was what is referred to as an unpopular defendant. An unpopular accused, such as a member of a minority group, for example. And the person they chose to arrest was Walter McMillan. We believe they chose to arrest him because he was a black man who had had an interracial affair. Did any law enforcement officer ever threaten you or make threatening remarks about your... I don't know why anybody would care about who slept with Karen Kelly. The police were desperate for a conviction and had no problem doing what it took. This mentality is explained by the concept of noble cause corruption. That is, when police believe that using unethical means to secure a conviction of someone they have satisfied themselves with as guilty is reasonable because of the belief that it benefits the greater good and ensures the conviction they need to close a case. One such way involved encouraging deceit and obtaining the coerced confessions of three witnesses to use in trial against McMillan. All three witnesses were found to have all received some form of compensation from the state for their incriminating testimony. He says, well, all you got to do is, is, is you go along with what we want you to go along with and, uh, and he says, I promise you, he says, I've done got it fixed with the DA, I've done got it fixed with the judge, and you won't get but 30 years. So 30 years, and you'd be eligible for parole after, well, uh, more or less probably like 10. This confession was one known as a coerced compliant confession, in which a confession is made in order to escape an aversive interrogation and or gain a promised reward. In Meyer's case, a more lenient sentence. Clay Cast, the mechanic who converted McMillan's truck, told us he did that work six months after Rhonda Morrison was murdered. Sure. It was, she got murdered in November of 86, and this, we're talking May of 87. So if Billy Hook says he drove by there and saw Johnny D's truck and it was a lowrider, then what you're saying is that, that Hooks is a liar. Yeah. It's He's benefited quite significantly based on his cooperation with the state in this case. He's gotten at least $5,000 in reward money. Uh, they dismissed fines against him. Are, are you saying that the cops offered Hooks a deal and then he testified? Oh, there's no question that Hooks got assistance from the cops in exchange for his testimony in this case. All three witnesses who had testified against McMillan retracted their testimonies in the end. That testimony put him on death row. Right. Was it true? No, sir. Not at all. Nowhere near true. As such, the entire case against McMillan began to fall apart and every piece of the prosecution's case that once existed was discredited. 
prosecutor's job is not to obtain a conviction, it's to achieve justice. Prosecutors often lose sight of the purpose of the justice system, which is to objectively seek the truth. This is due to a process referred to as the game. Essentially, it refers to the game-playing mentality inherent in our adversarial criminal process, where prosecutors view the process as a game where you either win or lose, pressuring them to present the most persuasive case against the accused, in addition to the pressure placed on them by the public. Mr. Stevenson turned up an overwhelming amount of evidence proving prosecutorial misconduct and lack of disclosure. In revealing the coerced confessions, he had simultaneously revealed the state too was encouraging deceit by knowingly allowing further witnesses to perjure themselves on the stand, knowing full well that history shows that juries are inclined to accept the testimonies of witnesses as fact because they find it difficult to believe that people lie under oath. But did the prosecutor talk to you at all about it? Yes, sir, the prosecutor did talk to me about it. In fact, he asked me to testify that the body had been drugged. The prosecutor asked you to testify that the body had been dragged to the back of the cleaner? Yes, sir, he did. And what did you say? I said, no, sir, I will not testify because I saw no evidence. In addition, the prosecution illegally suppressed exculpatory evidence that would have helped McMillan's case. They had withheld information regarding a witness who refuted the time prosecutors claimed McMillan had murdered Miss Morrison by sharing that they had seen the victim alive after this time. The jury should have known uh, that uh, a month before the trial took place in this case, Myers had gone to the state hospital and told four... As required by law, the prosecution must present any and all evidence in its possession. The judge was not much help in ensuring justice prevailed, as he was evidently a biased judge who favored the prosecution and viewed the trial and evidence in ways prejudicial towards McMillan. In moving the trial to a county with a higher white population, he knew he was putting the defense at a disadvantage due to the inherent racially driven ideologies of society and was not an impartial decision maker as judges are meant to be. The strong stereotypical association between black individuals and criminality in conjunction with the judge's personal prejudices only led to the endorsement of the decision to overrule the jury's recommendation and instead impose the harshest sentence possible on McMillan. The reality is, the corruption of the grounded level of the justice system, being the hands-on work of law enforcement, can only occur when there is corruption on the systemic level as well, being the political, economic, and social factors that ultimately lead to the marginalization of certain groups in society. Nearly 75% of the people here have been, who have been executed have been black. We have no public defender system here in Alabama. If you're a poor person accused of a capital crime, the court will appoint an attorney to you. That lawyer may have never done a capital trial before. The lawyer uh, will get paid very little money. We've got cases now where the lawyers represented people in capital trials uh, while they were drunk, intoxicated during the trial, lawyers who fall asleep during the cases. Despite the clear evidence that this had been a case of multiple miscarriages of justice, McMillan's conviction and death sentence were affirmed on appeal as it was ruled that conclusive evidence that testimony had been perjured had not been provided. The publicity of the case only continued to grow from here. McMillan's case was given national attention on the CBS news program 60 Minutes. Mr. Stevenson didn't stop fighting. He and his team prepared a motion to submit their evidence to the state Supreme Court in Montgomery, Alabama. It took six long years of hearings and appeals but on February 23, 1993, the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals ruled that McMillan's conviction was in fact unconstitutional, reversing his conviction and ordering a new trial. On March 3, 1993, the county district attorney joined the defense in a motion to dismiss the charges, and after six years, Walter McMillan was released from death row as a free man. This case was one of guilty until proven innocent. 
The law is intended to ensure fairness among all individuals. However, this standard falls short when the justice system is prepared to proceed on the presumption of guilt if the accused is a member of a marginalized population. Macmillan lost six years of his life because of the miscarriages of justice carried out by those who are meant to prevent exactly that. But his case is not unique. The only way to correct wrongful convictions is by building a system that prevents them altogether and realizing that we cannot be fully evolved human beings until we care about the basic dignity and human rights of all mankind.